I'm going to call the meeting to order. Rebecca, please call the roll. Flournoy? Here. Hallie? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Gandy? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Ham? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Councilors, any changes to the agenda tonight? If not, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Approval of the minutes of the October 25th, 2021 Council meeting. Approval of the minutes of the November 1st, 2021 Special Council meeting. Approval of October 29th, 2021 payroll in the amount of $134,989.90. I'm at Council. Approval of the fiscal year 21 annual finance report. Acceptance of the Economic Development Committee minutes from October 11th and October 25th, 2021. Approval of total claims in the amount of $568,251.01. We had one claim uh, larger than 75,000 to Jones Contracting for the amount of 146,516.02. This is third for the 23rd and 9th Street paving. Motion to approve consent agenda. Second. Moved by Gandhi, second by Two Hill. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Gandhi? Yes. Two Hill? Yes. Rasmussen? Uh, abstain. Anderson? Yes, but I need to abstain from the special meeting. Hallie? Yes. Flournoy? Yes, but I'll abstain from the special yes. meeting minutes. Ham? Yes. Okay, we'll move on to public forum and appearances. Ann Walton and uh, Mark from Sierra Club. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll have two students reporting uh, this evening on the roundtable from Saturday as they were part of the roundtable event. Okay, how, how much time are you expecting, Ann? 15 minutes. Council, is that, that's pretty long. Are you okay with that? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, this is Ishita Mukadam from Maharishi School, and I'm a sophomore there. And this is Sara Kibita Falls from Maharishi School as well. We're going to be talking about uh, last Saturday. As you all know, we had a roundtable event um, at the Eco Barn. Um, this evening, we're going to report our results um, of that event as it is relevant to the several items you will be discussing tonight and over the next several weeks before the end of the year. The centerpiece of what we uh, were working on during the roundtable is the new initiative being coordinated by the University of Northern Iowa called the Resilient Iowa Communities Program. Council member Michael Halley has been intimately involved with this program along with the sustainability coordinators from around the state of Iowa. We are hoping tonight that you will agree that Fairfield would make a great pilot project under this project. So these were the five pillars we talked about during the round table. You might have seen these during, um, during the Go Green plan. So based on these five pillars of resilience under which community specific actions will be developed, the five pillars are building and energy, land use, transportation, environmental management, resilient economic and community development. And during the round table, we also came up with a sixth uh, pillar, education. If Fairfield became part of the pilot project, some of the benefits we would get were, sorry, wrong slide, would be assistance for implementation of activities under the five categories, connections for communities with outside resources, including nonprofits, support in applying for grants, opportunities for pairing communities with Green Iowa American Corps members, and introduce and support the ambassadors of sustainability programs to local high schools. So at the round table event on Saturday, Tamara Marcus and Ishita Mukadam were our, oh, sorry, were our lead facilitators and they kind of just helped us guide everything that we were going to discuss throughout the round table discussion. Throughout the round table discussion, we had 28 members, four of which were high school students attend. So like Ishita was talking about, our five pillars were on the left. And what we did during this roundtable discussion was that we divided up into the groups of the pillars that you were most interested in. Yes. Ashley, who among the council was present at this roundtable? 
I think it was Connie Boyer and Michael Haley that were there. That's and I'm and sorry, Dr. yes. Thank you. Um, so like Ishita was talking about, these were the five pillars that we were mainly working on, including education, which is not there. But we basically would go into the groups that we were most interested in and talk about what was already happening in Fairfield and what we would like to see done and plans for what funding we would need and what steps we would need to include more of that. So um, let me go to the next slide here. There we go. Uh, so we have collected all of our ideas um, into this document that we'll be passing out later. Um, the first two columns in this document are referring to uh, the proposed new ideas and the existing efforts that we're already doing. Um, we had ideas, uh, I won't go over them right now because that would take too long, you can read over in the document. And I also wanted to just mention here at the very bottom, there are some asterisks, um, some symbols in the text as you can see here at the bottom. These symbols have been um, impl uh, are an implementation of these new activities. The first symbol on the left shows that this is a priority activity when rated against all other activities in this category. The second symbol indicates that this may potentially be a good project to be supported by ARPA funds. The third symbol on the far right hand side is to indicate this project maybe could be developed into a shovel ready project for build, better, build back better funds. Sorry, that's like a tongue twister. Slide. Oh, sorry, I'm just learning how to do this. Um, and to complete this inventory, we also wanted to identify how many activities within the Go Green plan we already have and the Fairfield Forever plan complement the five pillars of the best practices we came up with during the weekend roundtable event. So we see here that there's a perfect marrying of these activities. Um, some of it are 10 years old, but um, how could this be a great foundation for the new strategic plan? Here, just to summarize everything, um, we started this weekend with five pillars. Um, we populated them with programs and projects relevant to Fairfield. And we added um, relevant pieces from the Go Green and Fairfield Forever plants. And now we believe we have a good foundation for the new sustainability coordinator to work with the sustainability task force on developing a new sustainability strategic plan, which also supports the given and gives direction to Fairfield as a pilot site under the Resilient Iowa Communities Program. We think that the city could work very well with the Sierra Club. So something we might be thinking is, why are we presenting all of this? Don't we already have a strategic plan? Um, and the reason being is that first, we saw that it was expired already. And another reason is that we feel as though it's somewhat narrow and it focuses with an intention as it's intended to be an action-based document to be implemented as quickly and effectively as possible. So we feel as though with what we have already um, done at the round table event we could add on since it's already expired. And, sorry, um, this is what we feel as though would be included in the strategic plan. It would serve as a community's roadmap and is used to prioritize initiatives, resources, goals, and action strategies to achieve an intended future. It is an action-oriented set targets and is measured on a regular basis for results. So here we have a quote from Yogi Berra. I got to learn today that this was a baseball player. Um, so he said, if you don't know where you are going, you might end up someplace else. And this is very true. Uh, and without a strategic plan for our community, we will neither be re sustainable nor resilient. So I just wanted to point out that um, other uh, communities like the Iowa State University, Ames, uh, Dubuque, and Decor have also implemented these strategic plans. So I just feel like we would be an awesome pilot city for this strategic plan. And now we hope with everything that we have presented that you will reconsider 
building a new a sustainable strategic plan as we have already started building a new one during the roundtable event. Um, and do you want to touch on this one? Thank you. Uh, as a result of this roundtable event and in discussion with sustainability coordinators around the state, um, we'd like to propose that um, the city or we, in partnership with the city, would like to have a, an information session on ARPA funds. Uh, it seems like most of the, many of the communities around Iowa are going out um, and the sustainability coordinators are going out into the communities and asking the public what they know about ARPA, do they have an interest in it, and we think that we could benefit, our community could benefit from hearing more about the parameters of the ARPA funds. And also, um, we've been able to identify some templates that can be used to apply for the ARPA funds and do some run-throughs, take some scenarios of things that we think might uh, benefit from being funded by ARPA, sending them through the, these templates and seeing whether they, meet, whether they qualify or not for ARPA funds. So um, we, and what the we is sort of this resilience coalition that's forming, um, would like to propose to the city that either you or we collectively um, bring some of these sustainability coordinators down here to Fairfield to help us um, take the, the sort of whole ARPA package out to the public. So that's a, a proposal on the table there. So thank you. We think um, it would help forward this uh, effort to move forward with a sustainability strategic plan. And if we could identify some funding in some ways. And if not ARPA, um, I think when we come together for these kinds of discussions, we're able to identify other funding sources as well, USDA. Um, and you know, as these guys said earlier, look at the Build Back Better funds as well. Uh, since the bill has been signed, and there will be part of the funding coming down the pike eventually to have shovel-ready <coughs> projects is something we could discuss as part of that package. So again, just another step moving towards uh, developing a sustainability plan. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, questions, Council? Oh, should we have one more? Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, just one final thought that we were going to incorporate in the middle, but I guess we can do it now, is that with the five pillars we were talking about before, while I was talking, I had mentioned that we had added an additional one for education, and a plan that we are already going to move forward with, um, with FHS, that we're going to try and plan, um, is that we wanted to incorporate more sustainability into our, t like, learning, like, everyday Learning. So something that we wanted to try out would be that the Maharishi Student Council and the FHS Student Council would join together and make a sustainability presentation and present it to all of FHS and Maharishi School together. First to kind of bind the two schools more as we're somewhat separated and we don't really bind with them too much. And to also incorporate more sustainability into our everyday learning. So after giving the presentation, the teachers would go through a course since there's a lot of online um, resources and also experts in town that we could use to teach the teachers first more about sustainability so they can use it more into their classroom. Thank you. Great, thanks. So I'd just like to conclude our presentation that uh, we believe that it would be a great partnership between the sustainability coordinator and the task force, the Sierra Club and the city council and our whole community working together. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I appreciate the fact that you want to work with uh, FHS. I think that's a great thing when our two schools come together and, and work together. So again, Council, do you have any questions for them? Okay. Well, just a reminder, we are voting on whether to join the Resilient Iowa Communities Program, and so they just did my job for me is spelling out all the great reasons why, but um, I just got to say, I just love the energy of this group and this they're, they're poised and ready for great things um, if we just give them a little support. Great. I agree. Thank you. It was a fun day. I didn't quite make it the whole time, but good energy there. Yep, I agree. Okay, so let's move on to resolution, action items, and ordinances. Uh, the first action item is to set a public hearing for the Sanitary Sewer Aerobic Digester Number 1 Replacement Project uh, for Monday, November 22nd 
at 7 p.m. Melanie, do you want to say anything just as a reminder? Um, so this is setting the public hearing on the rebid of this project. As you remember at the last meeting, the, um, the bid, bids came in significantly higher than we expected, uh, primarily due to the warranty period. So we did get that um, straightened out and decreased it to one year rather than five years because not all of the companies offer the five years. If uh, the company that does offer the five years gets it, we will talk with them about purchasing an extended warranty. Um, but this is really what we need to do in order to get a competitive bid on the capital improvement. Um, so, you, and I think McClure might be down here the next time. If not, I'll have a little more information um, on the project, like the engineer's estimate. Great, thank you. Motion to set public meeting. Moved by Anderson. Second. Second by Tuhill. Any discussion? If not, please call the roll. Anderson? Yes. Two Hill? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Ham? Yes. Hallie? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Gandy? Yes. The next action item is consideration to accept the strategic plan proposal. You saw this at the work session. Aaron? Yeah, as, as we talked about at the work session, but this is a great way for us to take our comprehensive plan and our capital improvements plan along with the funding that we have available to set some attainable and uh, market marking goals for us in the next couple of years. So it, it'll give us an opportunity to really look at what we're doing and how we're doing it to uh, really make sure we're getting where the council wants us to set go as far as policy is concerned, and then the department heads are go moving in the right direction as far as uh, each each department and accomplishing their goals for each year too. Also, or also. Okay, great. You can look at this too, along with some of the other things, and see if there's overlap. Yep. The things that they've come up with, as well. So, um, is there a motion to accept? The proposal. So moved. Second. second. Moved by Flournoy, second by Gandhi. Any other discussion or questions? Not, please call the roll. Flournoy? Yes. Gandhi? Yes. Ham? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Hallie? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Thank you. The next action item consideration to accept contract with Area 15 Regional Planning Commission for Community Development Black Grant, Black Block Grant Application Assistance. Um, Michael or yeah. Aaron, who's going to talk I'm about that? We were flipping a coin yep. on who's oh, okay. going to talk about I told him I'd take it. He can back me up. So um, Economic Development Committee had an initial conversation with the um, Sustainable Living Center about this grant. And there was a little bit of a, each group was waiting for the other to make a move. So there was a little bit of time lost. But what this is, this is the first step for the city to be a pass-through for this grant for the Sustainable Living Center to um, provide materials and education for anybody in the community interested in growing some of their own food. So if you read the language of this agreement, it's very clear the city will not owe them any money, will not owe Area 15 any money unless the grant is accepted. And then it's either a per per percentage of the grant goes to them or up to 3,500 in cash. But we already uh, made the the agreement they'll get a they'll get a percentage of the grant funds for administrating the grant. So it's no it's not a controversial decision because there's no cost to the city. But the Economic Development Committee will take a deeper look at this before our next meeting because we feel that we should. Um, though I think at this point, I don't know how you guys feel. I think this it's is it's a great project. It, I, I mean they're talking about <clears throat> helping the community um, place and educate regarding gardens right down to providing the hand tools necessary to do it and having checkout baskets that have everything you need to do. Um, so I, as an avid gardener, I can, I can see nothing wrong with this, and this the, program. The starter plants. So that yeah. Starter plants, you know, okay. how to collect your seeds at the end of the season, how to compost all of it. So seed just money. understanding what's the commitment from the city that you're asking? We are serving as a pass-through pass because through. they can't apply for this grant. It has to be city with, non <clears throat> with a nonprofit. Yeah. So sustainable living. You need to have a nonprofit uh, organization apply. Right. 
So the, the city in, in this in this instance, we're not on the hook for any dollars. It's going to be a pass through grant where we're going to be distributing the dollars. Uh, the grant will actually pay for the administration of the grant, writing the grant. In the but prior to the grant being submitted, the city will also get an opportunity to approve the grant, and then the grant will be submitted to the state. We've done this before. Yes, mm -hmm. this is not new. Yeah, but the fact that the area 15 is using some of the grant funds to administrate administer the grant also means our city staff will not be spending time doing so. So it's area 15 will make sure we hit all of our reporting deadlines and reports are submitted. Yeah, we can't we can't lose on this one. How's, how specifically are they bringing it into the community? I mean, just people who come and apply to They have like a whole or? timeline of education seminars based on where you're at throughout the year and what you should be doing when, and then um, rolling it out. They're talking everything from working with the schools to possibly working with nursing homes, um, to working with families, you know, through the library, they've they have thought about every way to reach as many people in our community as possible. It was a really amazing presentation. Yeah, recording training sessions so that, you know, and maybe I can't go tonight, but I can watch it later. Watch it later. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it, if you came, well, there weren't very many people at that last meeting, but it was a very thorough um, outline of the plan. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was impressed, and I and I, you know, I've been talking to a few people. The volunteer center. They've even also thought about environment control, like want to dealing with deer eating gardens and de mm -hmm. dealing with rabbits eating gardens. I mean, they've thought about everything. Great, it's a neat program. All righty. So I will make the motion to uh, accept the contract with Area 15 Regional Planning for this grant. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Halley, second by Flournoy. Any other questions or discussion? Not please call the roll. Kelly? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Gandy? Yes. Ham? Yes. Two Hill? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Uh, by the way, what what's the timeline for to get this grant in? Do we know yet? Does anybody know? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> as soon as possible. As soon as, <laughs> okay. Uh, we first we go through a The SOC has done all the work in. Hey, Bob, grant sorry grant. to interrupt you. Can you go to the microphone? Oh, sure. So they can hear you. Yes. So the SLC has done all the work in actually building the grant. Uh, Area 15 is going to take the work we've done and put it in the proper form, and it'll be ready to submit. So we really just need a contract for the city. And apparently, I understand from Michael that with this passing of this resolution, then that contract can start. They can start the work. This is a first come, first serve pool of $23 million, and so we want to be in as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you tell Go us ahead. again what the SLC stands for? Excuse me, Sustainable Living Coalition. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And good luck. We look forward to uh, the fruition of this happening. Um, next is uh, an action item, consideration of the Oak Wilt policy. So our city engineer had asked the Arbor Committee to put together a policy for oak wilt. Oak wilt is a fungal disease that attacks the oak's uh, vascular system so that it can't, can't move nutrients throughout the tree. So then it starts dying at the tips and eventually the whole tree can be dead. And it can pass from tree to tree through the roots. So a really majestic oak tree was taken down on is that Washington by Highland Avenue. Adams. 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 Yeah. Adams, Ad, Adams Avenue by Washington or by Highland, um, in the right of way. So it's a sh city tree. So this is the policy. It's basically twofold. It's how to deal with the situation, um, when not to cut a tree. Because if you cut a tree that's got oak wilt during a certain time of year, it spreads the fungus. So we want the street crews to know this policy and follow it and the parks as well so that they're not inadvertently spreading the fungus. And then in terms of replanting, it's all about diversity. You know, when you go with too many of the same kind of species, you're more susceptible to this kind of thing. There are certain oaks that are less susceptible to oak wilt. Do you have anything to add? Um, so the only thing I wanted to add was when um, e Emerald Ashborer was first 
I guess, brought to our attention in this area. The, the council made the decision that um, street trees, we were going to cut them down instead of trying to use a treatment on them. And um, so really, kind of, the purpose of bringing this policy to the council is that you agree um, that we're going to pretty much have the same um, method with the oak trees that you know, um, that will cut them down to prevent the spread as soon as possible, particularly if they're damaged in a storm and th that you're agreeing with what the street crews proposal is. Because none of us want to see trees cut down more than necessary, but we also want to try and limit the spread as much as possible. Just a quick question. <clears throat> the two oak trees that are preferred, are they on the, on the list of preferred trees for the city? Yeah, those, you know? are, those are natives. Okay. Yep. So the author of this policy essentially was uh, Cassidy Robinson, the new district forester from the DNR. So um, she's really excited about being more involved in the Fairfield community and, and was happy to put this together. But it's essentially just best practices. This is how you deal with it because, yeah, similar to Emma Ashbor, there are treatments, but they're expensive. And once you start them, you can't generally stop and you want to keep the tree alive. So... Um, so this is primarily for our city use yep. for our, and probably suggested for the public as it's a good policy right? but yeah this is for city street trees and city park trees we we do get calls from people who want to know what type of tree to plant in their yard and you know i say well we don't regulate that but you can use our right-of-way policy as a guidance for your yard so whether it's planting trees or in this case cutting them down we a lot of people appreciate the suggestions. The other thing I'll say that I had talked with the Arbor Committee and moving forward, something on our to-do list for next year is adding a development standard in our zoning code specifying a diversity of trees in development. Um, you know, this, we have, uh, help me, Carrington Point, Point is losing all of their trees because they planted only ash. Oh, and uh, so... The, by this time next year, they will have nothing out there. And, um, you know, we, we want to, we know there's going to keep being new diseases and stuff like that. And so we want to pre um, prepare ourselves for being more sustainable <coughs> on that side. And more resilient. That's right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I'll make the Boop. motion to approve this. Okay. Boop by Hallie. Second. Second, Second by Two Hill. Any other questions? Maybe. Please uh, call the roll. Just oh, go ahead. Are we providing some training for our people uh, in the city to identify which trees are infected, or is that easy to do or not? They have had training. Um, but that was years ago, and I don't know if it's the same crews. And when I say they, it was streets and parks. Um, there is a, a little bit of a habit of asking a tree removal company to give input, and I've tried to get them to instead ask the DNR district forester who's here. And conflict of interest. There. No conflict of interest. Just to... I remember the maples that came down on Maple Street, you know, some people were very upset and they accused, well, the tree removal company obviously wants the business, they're gonna say they have to go. So then we sent the district forester, Ray Len, and he said they should have been cut down yesterday. Those are very dangerous trees. He doesn't have any, you know, any money to be made. So I would like the city to start using Cassidy Robinson for those purposes. If they're in, if they're in doubt, like the big linden that came down on Central Park, um, you know, just to have a second opinion and get somebody who's a trained arborist or a trained, trained forester, because um, they're going to always have the best insight compared to somebody who got partial but it training. it behoove us to identify it early so that it doesn't get removed to another tree. Oh, Oakwell? Yeah. You got to keep an eye on it. Okay, great. Um, go ahead and call the roll. Hallie? Yes. Two Hill? Yes. Andy? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Pam? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next resolution, consideration of said public hearing to sell real estate located at 105 West Jefferson for Monday, November 22nd, 2021 at 7 p.m. This is the... Let me say something about yes, this. Yes, go ahead, John. The library board reported to us in their last report that they had sold this. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a title opinion from the buyer's attorney saying maybe they sold it, maybe they didn't. 
Uh, actually, it's titled in the city of Fairfield is why we're having this hearing, even though the library board thinks they sold it. So they've got to go through their steps as a subsidiary of the council, followed by us doing the usual thing we do when we convey property that's public property. So you set the hearing, you publish the notice, you see if there's any objections on November 22nd, and then the back side of this resolution is the conveyance resolution that you do. But this doesn't come up very often where you get maybe a board like Park and Rec or the library board that acts quasi-governmentally, uh, uh, and then we have to finish the rest of it. Okay. Great. Thank you for uh, clarifying that, John. Appreciate it. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to set public meeting. Uh, moved by Anderson. Second. Second by Gandhi. Any other questions? Discussion? Please call the roll. Anderson? Yes. Gandhi? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Halley? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Ham? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, next resolution, consideration of participation in the Resilient Iowa Communities Pilot Program. All right, so I'm going to read a couple items from the resolution just because I can't word it any better myself. Uh, Resilient Iowa Communities is a voluntary assistance and recognition program to help cities achieve their sustainability and quality of life goals. This free continuous improvement program from the Center for Energy and Environmental Education at the University of Northern Iowa is based upon a menu of optional best practices in five categories, which you've already heard. Uh, each best practice can be implemented as decided by city elected officials, staff, and community members by completing one or more actions at a bronze, silver, or gold level. Um, so that pretty much sums up what the program is. For those of us who were around for Blue Zones, it's kind of like Blue Zones. Uh, for those who were there when we did Soul Smart, it's not unlike those programs. It's voluntary, and it's there to support your goals. What we found with Blue Zones was that when the city and the community engaged in that, you saw all these little shoot-offs where um, private groups were doing their own thing. And so for the city to do this, it's not going to be just about the city. It's going to be about the community. But when the community sees the city take the lead, uh, it inspires private action. So this is a um, pilot program. So if you go to what's expected of us, uh, we're putting our, the new sustainability coordinators, uh, the main contact, and we will involve the community and we will provide feedback. And we will claim any credit towards becoming this kind of certified bronze, silver, gold level, resilient Iowa community, which I've also noticed when people, when cities compete with each other, it kind of lights a little bit of a fire, you know, like we want to be gold. And so, um, but the feedback's going to be important. And already we've seen this local sustainability coalition. Now they don't have the goals yet that are going to be in this program, but they took the green step goals that this program is based off of and created a sixth category. So that's the kind of thing that the pilot program is all about is there's input and it's a two-way conversation. So communities get to basically help develop the program. So after the pilot, which will be a fewer numbers of, of cities, it'll expand in its next year. And um, I mean, based on everything that's already happening with the Sustainability Coalition, what we heard tonight, Fairfield's gonna knock this out of the park. We're gonna actually show the other communities how it's done and it's, uh, it's the perfect timing for this. I remember being on Let's Go Jeffco, which was the, city, the local wellness initiative, and then Blue Zones came along. I remember Ken Daly said it was like a, fit like a hand in a glove. It was exactly the program that we needed to take our internal initiatives to a higher level, and I feel like we're there again. We've got all this local interest, all this local energy, and this is a, a way to unleash it and channel it. And again, as mentioned, there's all this support that comes with it where this RIC will tell the communities about grant opportunities and put you in touch with experts. And um, for a no-cost program, it's going to be very valuable. 
Not really a downside from what I can see. As I understand it, it's this is this uh, the participation. They're primarily advisory in nature to the city. Is that right? Or what commitment? I mean, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. Is there a commitment we're asking of the city? It sounds like we'll be getting advice as part of, as a member of the program, and the city will decide what how to implement those suggestions and feedback, I guess, to the to the pilot program. At the very least, yeah, you get the you get the list of of five categories, six actions, so thirty total actions that you could take, and then the community decides which ones to take. Actually, you get credit for ones you've already taken, so that's. There's a bunch of them that we'll get credit for, like putting solar on city buildings. We've done that. Um, but there's more to it. There's more support than just the one person from University of Northern Iowa. It's this whole advisory board. And advisory board is essentially all the sustainability coordinators from all the bigger cities in the state. So they're doing this full time. You've also got Jeff Gertz from Iowa Development Authority who knows about grants and, and funding. Um, like, I feel like a lightweight amongst this group, but they like my perspective as a small town elected official. So uh, you get them as well. So they're, they're like the task force to the sustainability coordinator that we're going to have. They're the advisory board to this. I'm just person. asking, so it doesn't sound like we're actually, actually not binding the city to anything other than we're participating. Yep. We'll be getting advice, yep. suggestions from a wide variety of experts. Yep. We can sort of pick and choose what we Yeah, and then, and, you know, you could just not do anything and... There's no penalty. <clears throat> of course, well, we're not going to do that. The point is that if we use them, we'll get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. If we ignore them, we won't get anything. Right. Yeah. So they're really there. They have an open door. All we can do is ask them questions, and they'll put us in the right direction. Yep. And with the sustainability coordinator starting soon, I'm not sure. You know, very soon. Uh, the timing couldn't be couldn't be better. You know, it's why would you not want additional support for that? Person, especially when they're first starting out. So, real benefit to the cities. We're going to get a lot of our goals and policies that we want for Fairfield Forever plan enacted. Yeah. Get them Thanks off. Thanks to the Sierra Club and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see all the energy, and they, they just can't stop coming back. They want <laughs> they want this to happen, and they, this is a way to put them into action. Seems like a pretty good thing. Okay, so I'll take a motion. So moved. Moved second. by Anderson, second by Flournoy. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Anderson? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Ham? No. Halley? Yes. Gandy? Yes. Okay, so that uh, passed six to one. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I'm going to open a public hearing uh, regarding the matter of the proposed amendment number one to the North Campus Village Phase 5 Urban Renewal Plan. But Aaron, why don't you speak to this first and then I'll open the public hearing. Yeah, the amendment to uh, North Campus Village, well, there's actually two things to Phase 5 that we're amending. Amendment number one is to lengthen the amount of time that we can collect t tax increment financing to ensure that we pay back... Um, the developer, what we had promised at the beginning, we had made a mistake with the uh, certifying of debt too early. So it was there was a question as to whether or not we were going to be able to uh, hold up our end of the bargain with the time frame. So by extending the time frame a little bit, that'll make sure that we can pay back our our end of the bargain part through the tax. So the TIF district doesn't go into red. Right. Yes. Well, it just means that with a residential TIF, you can only go for a certain period of time for, for like a 10-year period. We, we certified a 10-year period, but we started it too soon because the development was, our, was in the building process. So when we started making a payment, we weren't paying on the entire amount of assessed value. We were at a smaller amount, so we weren't giving the developer as much as what we could have if we'd have hold, held off a year or two to certify the debt. Once you start that clock, you're stuck to the clock, So, or you have to amend the development agreement. So we, we're amending the development agreement to make sure we hold up our side end of the we're just, we're setting the clock. Just, we're just ex extending it a little bit. We're going into overtime. <laughs> This was discussed at Economic Development Committee, and we, we approved it unanimously. 
So I'll make the motion. Approve. Oh, we have to yes. do a public hearing. Yeah, let's do a public, yeah, hearing, do a public hearing first. Yeah. Uh, do we have anybody? Rebecca doesn't look like it. So we'll close the public hearing now. We'll accept your motion. Uh, move to pass the resolution to consider determining an area. Which one are we on? Second. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> It's too many words. <laughs> right. Okay. So moved by Hallie, second by Flournoy. Any other discussion? Please call the roll. Hallie? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Gandy? Yes. Ham? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you want to talk about the next one before I open the public hearing? Are we on the on the uh, developer's agreement? Yeah, the developer's agreement yes. is is actually... North Campus Village Phase 5 Part 2, um, where we're adding more LMI housing to Phase 5, and we're just, because Phase 5 is an LMI development, we have to, we have to attach it to that rather than doing Phase 6, which was, we approved last year, LMI. or two years ago, low, low to moderate income. Thank you. And so we're attaching the second area to Phase 5 to add another 40 something 40 something and, and there were some two some three and a lot of four bedroom units so these are there um, was like one two but yeah it was like a one two but or something. again <laughs> it, we're going to add a num number of actual low to moderate income housing into an area to help with our housing issues which we all know are we're short okay with that i'll open the public hearing Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and we'll move on to the resolution uh, of the same. Motion to approve development agreement with Vastu Partners. Second. second. Moved by Anderson, second by Flournoy. Any other discussion? I just listed four one bedroom units, one two bedroom, 18 three bedroom, and 12 four bedroom units in this development. Thank you. Uh, please call the roll. Anderson? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Gandy? Yes. Hallie? Yes. Ham? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Okay, we have one more resolution. Consideration to approve and authorize ex execution of a First Amendment to the agreement for private development by and between the City of Fairfield and Vastu Partners, LLC. An extension of one of the agreements that this is all part of those developers' agreements in TIF. Okay, it's so the, this the is another extension. Yeah, it's part of the TIF stuff that the attorneys are asking us to do. I, I want to give a real basic ex explanation on that one. Motion to approve. Second. Moved by Anderson, second by Flournoy. Any other discussion? Please call the roll. Anderson? Yes. Flournoy? Yes. Ham? Yes. Gandy? Yes. Hallie? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Okay, we have the second reading for ordinance number 1206, consideration of amendment to the regulations of peddlers, solicitors, and transient merchants. I'll open a public hearing. Does anybody, do we have anybody here to speak to that? If not, I'll close the public hearing. And uh, council, have you had any public comment that you want to share? None. Okay, not, I'll take a motion. You can say I did last time, that's why I thought maybe you wanted to Let it Has it changed since the last reading, Michael? No, I just thought. I can't remember. Melanie, was it here or just, I don't know. I just thought she would like to say something. No, Dave uh, just made fun of me for talking to you. I make the motion that we move ordinance 1206 from the second to the third and final reading. Thank second. you. Second. second. Uh, moved by Florida, I second by Gandhi. Huh. Any other discussion or questions? No. Not please call the roll. Flournoy? Yes. Gandhi? Yes. Ham? Yes. Tuhill? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Rasmussen? Yes. Hallie? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll move on to the mayor's report. Uh, first, I want to give our condolences to Martha, and thanks for being here tonight, Martha. And, uh, you know, we've been thinking of you and your family, and you're in our thoughts and prayers. It's good to be back. So have you set the date for service? Yes. It, uh, there will be a memorial service for Bob on the Friday, the 19th of November. Okay. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, okay. and then there's a reception at the country club following that. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. Where is the memorial service? Yeah. Yes. Where? Where? Are those Where? The, the services are being held in the Presbyterian Church. Okay. Thank you. 
Mm-mm. Okay, great. Thank you for giving us that information. Um, next answer. thing I want to mention is at the work right. session, we talked about uh, the nuisance codes and rental inspections and referring that to the public safety committee. And Katie's really excited about that. <laughs> this is what happens when I don't make a meeting, right? <laughs> That's right. So um, the idea is that it would go to safety committee and they're going to discuss whether they're going to take that project on themselves and relook at all those ordinances or they want a task force to help them to do that. Um, but anyway, let's get it to the safety committee. So I would make a motion to move it over there. I'll make the motion to refer the, the uh, nuisance code rental inspection codes to the transportation and safety committee. Second. Okay, moved by Flournoy, second by Rasmussen. Vote no. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Sarah Katie, you get it. It's because you're so good. Okay, I wanted to give you a, a quick report on uh, the 9-11 board and emergency management just to keep the uh, council informed, um, which we had a meeting last week. At emergency management, one of the things that we passed was a property management equipment disposition policy. Basically, it's about the inventory of equipment that we have and how it's handled. So I think that was a good policy to pass. Um, Brett Farrell is also working on an ARPA grant, and um, he expects to get about $12,000. So that money will be spent on an enclosed trailer and a generator with lighting. Um, probably there will be additional funds from emergency management that will pay for those items because I would the, we don't anticipate the ARPA grant will pay for everything. Um, the trailer, what they realized um, with the last year and a half, Brett was moving a lot of things in the back of his pickup, and that's not great for when things are, when it's raining. So that's why we wanted to get an enclosed trailer for storage and and moving things around. So that's emergency management on the uh, E911 board. Uh, just to let you know, they now have an additional part-time employee and. That's been really helping getting all of the uh, 911 addresses updated around the county. And that's important because when emergency services have to go there, if there's not uh, an address there, then there's been some confusion with um, emergency services. So that's great. That's gotten updated. Uh, we saw a presentation on the ISIC system, which has to do with radios and uh, communication throughout the county. So depending on, and there's a couple ways that they can go with updates and all this stuff. So these are things that uh, police and sheriff are looking at and uh, and uh, the 911 board. So at some point in the future, it is possible that they could be asking for additional funds for radios for police and fire, but it's unknown at this time and I don't have a figure. So that's to be continued. Um, on November 22nd at 5 p.m., you have all been invited, council, to go to get a tour of the Carnegie Museum. So that's our next council meeting. Um, again, it's at 5 o'clock prior to our council meeting, and they've been doing a lot of um, new displays there, and it's downstairs. They have this chronological kind of history of Fairfield. And it's pretty neat to see, and they want to share it with you. So you're all invited, again, at 5 o'clock on November 22nd to come to the Carnegie Museum and get a tour. Okay, the last thing um, <clears throat> that I have is I'm going to read a statement um, that we've prepared regarding this last week. So... Um, our community has been shaken by the tragic death of Noama Graber. It is important that the legal process be allowed to work to ensure the matter is thoroughly investigated and prosecuted. Local authorities are working with state partners to make this happen. Authorities are required to refrain from making comments that have a substantial likelihood of prejudicing the accused. Authorities are allowed to make statements asking the public for spe specific information 
or to alert the public of any danger. We are assured the public is not in danger at this time. This council is not an investigative body and has no information beyond what is available to the public. We encourage anyone with direct evidence about the case to contact the Fairfield Police Department. The city will make no further comment while the criminal justice, justice system continues with its investigative process. This is applicable to city officials, employees, and departments. Further inquiry should be restricted to the county attorney prosecutor's office. Please refrain from social media dialogue and third party commentary. Please respect the system. We cannot be the information source or the media. Please let the just justice system work. And thank you for adhering to this. Thank you very much. Mayor Boyer, I'd like to yes. add just a couple comments to what you just read. Our, our police department in the last month or last week has done a fantastic job from my experience in law enforcement of handling this case and getting this as close to buttoned up as possible in the short period of time is what they've done. They, they have worked great with the DCI and all their partners to get this, to, this case to where it is. And they've also done a fantastic job of tying up any loose ends that have come up since then. And they, they, they should be commended along with all the other public safety uh, agencies within our city that have been in assistance to this. Great. DCI. Thank you. What's the DCI? DCI is handling. What is the DCI? Department of Criminal Investigation. It's the state branch of the investigative side of the state police department thank you, thank you. Um, so let's move on to the city attorney report John do you have anything tonight I don't think anything beyond what we just talked about. okay great thank you uh, committee and board reports ways and means thank you mayor the ways and means committee met this, this evening all members of the committee Doug Flournoy Katie Anderson and myself were present we had two items on our agenda presented to us by Aaron Coyker our city administrator the first item had to do with, as listed on the agenda, finance depository institution. As many of you know, First National Bank uh, recently entered into an agreement to be purchased by Midwest One Bank. Midwest One Bank is a regional bank. First National Bank was a locally owned bank or near, nearly a locally owned bank. And the question arises, should the city maintain its accounts, which are several million dollars, at First National Bank or consider transferring it to a locally owned bank. The committee, after some discussion, is recommending to the council that the city administrator uh, do further research and perhaps come up with a comparison and contrast between the two locally owned banks, which we understand to be Libertyville Savings Bank and Iowa State Bank, with the goal of possibly transferring our accounts at First National Bank to one of these locally owned banks uh, by the beginning of the new year and with the decision made by the council by the end of this year. So our motion, our recommendation to the council is that we um, instruct Mr. Uh, Corker to proceed with this uh, further research and present to the Ways and Means Committee. And then we'll discuss it and present our recommendation to the council. Okay, thank you. So I'm making a motion then that we further instruct Mr. Coker, our city administrator, to do additional research as to comparing our locally owned banks with the idea of transferring, perhaps, uh, with the recommendation of council, transferring our accounts from First National Bank to a locally owned bank by the beginning of next year. Second. Okay. Moved by Gandhi, second by Floyd. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Thank you. That passed. The second item for discussion this evening was a refer uh, the, the issue has to do with the financing of what the council has approved to be a new fire station to be built, I believe, in 2022. The question has to do with whether or not the council needs to proceed with or instruct the city administrator to be laying, to begin laying the groundwork for a referendum in the spring of this year. It turns out that based upon the financing requirements of building a fire station, we are going to need to borrow money, some amount. We're not sure what the amount is going to be. But we're going to need to borrow some money. There will be funding from other sources, perhaps, but there is going to be some amount of borrowing we need to, 
to undertake. And so uh, it was suggested by the city administrator that he undertake laying the groundwork to begin uh, preparing for a rep possible rep referendum in the spring of this year so that we can proceed with the funding in a timely manner and begin building the fire station, I believe, the fall of next year. We, we would get the bids set and then hopefully break ground in the spring of In the next spring year. of next year. Or spring of 2023. Spring of 2023? All right. All right. So the recommendation from a Ways and Means to the Council is that we further instruct Mr. Koyka to proceed with laying the groundwork for a referendum in the spring for funding, for funding or partially funding a new fire station. Second. Okay. Okay. Motion. I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> but I meant it to be a motion. The, like a motion. the motion is just what I said, <laughs> but I add the word motion. Second. Okay. It's moved by Gandhi, second by Flournoy. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That, that concluded our meeting. Okay, thank you. Administrator and department reports. Um, in front of you, I put I uh, placed a memo um, regarding our first quarter financial report. Um, in general, things are going as expected this fiscal year. Uh, cash on hand balances are in line with previous years. Um, we as an update, we currently have $4 million in CDs with First Community Choice Credit. We also have $3 million invested with IPATE, which is a state government entity at this point. Um, we were requested by First National Bank in November, or excuse me, in, at the end of September to tra transfer fun some public funds out of First National Bank. So the only option we had was to transfer it to IPATE at this point. So there's some funds at IPATE. Um, the rest of the funds are still sitting at First National Bank, which uh, overall funds, we have $18 million on hand, including the CDs and the investment at IPA. This is First Community Credit Union, isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. That's where, well, that's where the CDs are, is it? First Community Credit. Yeah. Any questions, Council? Okay, great, thank you. Good to have a healthy checkbook balance. Uh, anything from Melanie? No. no, okay. Uh, looks like we're at the end of our meeting. I'll request a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Twohill. Second. Second by Gandhi. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Yeah. Motion carried. Meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone for your time.